Hello and shalom, everybody. My name is Julia Jassy, and you are listening to Nice Jewish Girls, brought to you by Unpacked, a division of Open Door Media. On today's episode, we are talking with Carly Pildes. As of very, very recently, Carly is the Director of Community Engagement for the Anti-Defamation League, known as the ADL. But when we recorded with her only a few weeks ago, she was the Associate Director of Community Engagement. So mazel tov on the promotion, Carly. Carly comes from a background in politics. She spent the beginning of her career working in DC as a professional and an advocate, only to realize that her passion was with the Jewish community. Now her work is bringing together the community in ways she never could have anticipated at the start of her career. I want to ask Carly about the bravery that comes with making a career change. What inspired her to do it? I want to talk to her about the two very different, yet integrally related, means of outreach to which she has committed herself, public advocacy and community building. I am so excited for you guys to meet her. Let's do this thing. Carly Pildes serves as the Associate Director of Community Engagement for the ADL. She has dedicated her career to fighting for justice and equity on a global and national scale through advocacy, organizing, and writing. In the past, she's worked for the Jewish Democratic Council of America, Tablet Magazine, Results, Obama for America 2012, Jubilee USA Network, and American Jewish World Service. In addition, she serves as a board member for the JCRC of Greater Washington, the Young Jewish Leadership Board of the Greater Washington Jewish Federation, JDCA's Next Gen Leadership Council, and the Inter-Jewish Muslim Alliance. She has been featured in basically every Jewish and non-Jewish publication ever, and in her free time, Carly enjoys engaging in Jewish Twitter and making Shabbat with her family. Carly, it's so wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. I love the idea for this podcast. Yeah, it's an honor to have you. You've done such great stuff in the Jewish community, and I'm excited to get into your story. I want to start really from the beginning here. Can you tell us a bit about where you're from? I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts, really right in Brookline. Big Jewish community, really vibrant Jewish life from childhood on. And can you tell us a bit about your background growing up as a Jewish woman, your identity and your relationship with that identity? Yeah. So Judaism was a huge part of my life growing up. We went to synagogue every week. We went to Hebrew school, Jewish summer camp, bar and bar mitzvahs, the whole thing. What is different a little bit about my Jewish childhood than others is as we were going through this very sort of typical Jewish life, sort of archetypal Boston Jewish suburban childhood, my mother had this big religious awakening and decided to become a rabbi at 50. And it was such an inspirational thing for me on so many levels. One, to see her, you know, thriving as a wife and a mother and decide like, I want my next chapter to be devoting myself to this and I'm going to do it. And in a really difficult way, Boston didn't have a rabbinical program at that time, which is hard to believe now. She didn't want to uproot the family or my father's successful medical practice, but she found someone who was willing to sponsor her. She did it through the Olive program so she could do it through the correspondence. And, you know, seeing her go through that evolution from mom who's really engaged and on all these synagogue committees and doing that to being like, no, I want something more text-based. I want to be a leader in a different way. I want to push myself. And her uh, evolution was so inspiring to me. Really, one, the, the idea that as a Jewish woman, like, you don't have to stay in an archetype. You can be the mom who's doing everything and is waiting at school at the end of the day. And you can also... You'll be a rabbi, do other things, have a whole other huge life, and that that life can change and you're not sort of stuck in an archetype. And that Judaism really needs to be claimed by you and owned by you and developed by you to work into a fulfilling Jewish life that fits you and your family. And I remember, like, you know, seeing her uh, on the Bima, seeing her get smicha, seeing her go on to the Rashi school and just having this huge second career impacted how I think about Judaism so much. I remember coming home from Hebrew school crying because I had a teacher who said that you couldn't be, you know, a religious Jew and be gay. And I said I didn't want to bar mitzvah. I didn't want to be Jewish anymore. I was really 
upset. So my mother went and she got down all these books and we sat there and we read together and we talked Torah together and we talked commentary together until I felt better. And she was like, you need to claim your power in this space and you need to claim your role in this space and no one is going to give it to you. And, you know, I watched her face misogyny, face judgment, and also at the end saw her standing on top in just a really fulfilling, beautiful Jewish life. So to me, those stories are really intertwined. Like growing up with the biggest presence in my life, my mother, uh, really claiming Judaism for herself. And it was just such a beautiful thing to have. And I'm hoping my daughter will feel the same way. I think it's really interesting. I mean, all of what you just said, but especially that last part, that your relationship with your mother as her daughter is something that you want to give to your daughter. And I think that's a big piece of, I mean, this podcast in general of passing this knowledge on and this hope on to next generation of women um, and using Judaism as a tool of empowerment, I think is is beautiful. And you've done a lot of that in your own work now. So you're having this really robust background in politics and Jewish nonprofit work. Um, how did you find yourself in this role? It was an interesting evolution. I don't have like the typical Washington background. If you look at my resume, like from the beginning of my career, you're like, how did this happen? Like often in interviews to beginning, people would be like, did you go to Bennington and measure in like theater? Like what, what happened there? Uh, I went on American Jewish World Service trip uh, to Ghana and it was just a really eye-opening and incredible experience. Uh, and really being in a place that was affected by poverty so greatly, but not in the sort of poverty porn narrative that gets portrayed in the U.S., where people really are fighting to get out of poverty all day, writing grants, building things. You go to the Internet Cafe and everyone's starting an NGO, everyone's starting a nonprofit, everyone is building uh, and it's not the sort of really passive and racist and colonialist view we see in America of like people waiting to be sort of like rescued. They're rescuing themselves. And you're just sort of AJWS is very clear about this. Like you're really there to learn from them and what they're doing and provide, you know, whatever support you can in a very limited capacity. But really like the one benefiting from these trips is you, which is really different than how a lot of people phrase it. And I came back and a lot of the work I'd been doing in Vermont, which was very ethereal and very sort of writing plays and creating art to discuss politics felt less fulfilling than it had before. And I have a lot of friends who went on to do that work and are successful and very happy, but it, it didn't really work for me anymore. And I wanted to make the transition really out of the arts and into the organizing and advocacy world. I got hired from American Jewish World Service to go and do their organizing program in New Hampshire which is just really incredible. I went from like, all my friends are dressed as fairies and dancing in fields and like dancing to Martha Graham, which is what Bennington is like. It's a great place to do art, to being like, and now I'm meeting Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton and I have to talk about like international debt in a compelling way, like very quickly or like talk about Darfur. And it was very uh, nerve wracking and intellectually compelling and difficult. And I loved it and I never looked back. Uh, I often joke, I like kept all the skills from the theater stuff, but I never really had a desire to like do the art, but so much of it was applicable. The storytelling, the need to be able to talk and play different roles in different places, uh, the, the need to be able to tell narratives, but really the evolution was in a lot of ways, like Jewish to Jewish to Jewish. My mom was very concerned that there was not enough Jewish life at Bennington and she wanted to keep me on whatever her version of the derech is. So she's like, I really want you to do something Jewish this summer. I really want you to do something <laughs> Jewish this summer. And I was like, I don't want to. I want to get drunk with my friends this summer, mom. <laughs> and she's like, what about this trip? And I was like, well, that looks really cool. I want to go on a trip uh, with really, like, not sophisticated intentions around it. But I was like, that looks cool. And then through, I, I think I sort of found the next phase of fulfilling Jewishness in that, of what was really next for me. When you explained your mom's story, um, you told a story that was very unconventional. You know, she found her connection to Judaism and became a rabbi at 50. Um, and making a career change is often something that takes a lot of guts. Um, and for you, you didn't expect that this would be the place that you went into. Um, and you went into politics, into advocacy. Um, and you went in 
did that after having gone to um, school to get a degree in theater, which is not the, the natural path to getting there, but it is a really empowering one because it came from your experiences. Um, and since then, what are some of those experiences that you've had that have catapulted you from kind of the more political space to the more Jewish nonprofit advocacy space? You know what? A couple things, like one of the big things I learned through my childhood is is that dreams change over time and that's okay. And like, uh, that's something you can embrace. I really wanted to do HIV AIDS work. I wanted to do foreign aid work. That was what I came to Washington to do. And I did it for eight years and it was an incredible experience. I remember uh, when the Ebola outbreak was happening, I got a call from a volunteer I was working with who's an international student here crying because his sister, a nurse in Liberia, had just died of Ebola. Her very first job out of nursing school, you know, working for Doctors Without Borders and and died very quickly. And he so wanted to make her death meaningful and to be able to say, like, we're going to set you up with Hill meetings and you're going to tell your story and we're going to put it on NPR and CNN. And like to be able to do that global justice work uh, and be able to show young people in America, like you really can affect these major access to uh, education, access to healthcare issues on a global scale was so empowering. And then I think a couple things happened. One, as much as I love that job and it was a really empowering place to be, it's very difficult to achieve on the level I wanted to achieve as a Jew who would like to have a deep Jewish life on an American Christian calendar. And I was really jealous of my friends whose like calendars were synced with their religious life and their cultural life. And that became something I really just like longed for, like the ability to like have multiple days off at Sukkot or like have some Torah off or have a week off at Passover. And it's a very difficult thing to ask from the American sort of not Jewish world. That was something that happened very quickly with motherhood. But then the bigger thing was my own community began to find itself in crisis. And that is not something I could have predicted or I think anyone would have predicted. So I was doing this global justice work that I really loved. And my own community was, you know, facing growing anti-Semitism, facing political violence, facing growing instability. And there was just so much happening in my own country, in my own community, that I felt this real sort of longing to devote myself to that. And that started with the writing. I would say, I don't want to walk away from the work I'm doing now, but I feel like I have to do more with my community. I have to write about these things. I have to write about, you know, where we should be on immigration and where we should be in fighting anti-Semitism and and how we need to do better within our own community. You know, in some ways it's easier to face like these external causes, but also looking at the racism in our own community and the misogyny in our own community and feeling like a deep longing to do more of that um, and to write about that. And then the election came and I got the opportunity to really, you know, you get that call from someone like Haley and it just feels uh, like the angels are singing and you're at the end of the Disney movie and the fireworks are going off and you're like, yes, I want that job. I literally, I was so happy about it. Um, so really just like the need for, for that skill set in the Jewish community called me back. That's Haley Soifer from um, Jewish Gems. She's actually a guest on our podcast previously, and it's really interesting to get your perspective from it um, because you came into this space from a different path. And I think it's really interesting that you told that story about the young man whose sister died from Ebola. I think that Ebola is often a story that's told without the empathy that it deserves. And I think that anti-Semitism is very different, but that same kind of deep cultural understanding that is needed and to see the way that it affects communities, not just as a systemic problem, but as a personal problem. Um, I think it's interesting that you told the story of a young man whose sister died of Ebola and the story of anti-Semitism now, and not just because those are two fields that I have particular interest in, but just because I find that they take similarly unexpected levels of interpersonal empathy to understand. And I think in the end, a lot of it is about stories and wanting them to be told. And, you know, in the global space, it was a lot about like whose stories are getting told and where are they getting told and getting people in the room uh, and sort of helping Americans understand that their stories of why they care would move members of Congress and move the issue. I think on the Jewish side, there is a lot of 
storytelling as well, but the stories are, you know, there's, there's such a political battle and so, so much ideological battle about like whose stories matter and when and where and helping people to really own their stories and claim them and tell them in compelling ways that really push the envelope on policy and power. And that's a lot of what I've been doing at EDL, you know, working with lay leaders, working with uh, GLASS, our, our fellowship program that's doing professional based and talking to people about like how hate has affected their lives, how anti-Semitism has affected their lives. So for example, you know, talking to someone who said, well, you know, my synagogue had a hate crime. I live in a rural area. We got a nonprofit security grant and it made me feel safer, you know, when I'm there and when my kids are at school in that facility, helping people sort of realize that like, that isn't a story that they should be ashamed of or be afraid to talk about. And it's really helpful for members of Congress to hear those stories. So right now we're fighting for 360 million, uh, you know, an almost doubling of the money for that grant. That goes directly to synagogue security. It goes directly to really into the field and not just synagogues, mosques, other vulnerable religious institutions uh, that really don't benefit from some of the other government grant programs but telling people like your member of Congress needs to hear from you if if you've benefited from this or if you think you would, they they're not going to know sort of innately. And helping people tell those stories in the halls of power is just the most beautiful thing for me. Absolutely, um, and I think it's really interesting your emphasis on storytelling because you have a theater background, um, and you would naturally expect a theater background to go into policy and advocacy, I would think it would go probably more into film or, or playwriting. But in the same sense, this dedication to the telling of stories um, and the authenticity of stories has remained. Do you find that that background in theater helped you to appreciate storytelling or affect the way that you do tell stories now? Absolutely. I mean, I think it helps to, it helps you sort of frame narrative and think about narrative. It helps you to train people and coach people. Um, and it helps you to think about audience, you know, different stories work differently in different places. So I'm often, you know, talking to people about like how to make their story relevant on the Hill or what policies they can tie it to, to really push issues forward. And I also think when we talk about women, like there is so much silence and so much stigma uh, around women telling their stories. And, and I'm really all about pushing Jewish women to do that, even when it's very difficult. You know, I wrote uh, a lot of like very difficult personal things about motherhood, about fertility. But I think, you know, women need to hear from each other, particularly the Jewish American women. I think there's so much pressure. There's that pressure to achieve that I think we don't talk about enough. There's pressure to be a leader uh, in your religious life, to be the sort of archetypal, perfect Jewish mother. But then that faces like an enormous amount of misogyny within it. And I think it's so important that we tell each other stories. Like it's okay that being a mom is maybe a little harder than you thought it was going to be. I dropped my kid off at school in pajamas today because I overslept. But like we, I really feel like the archetype of like perfection and silence is like what I'm always fighting against. Like you can be an incredible mom, an incredible leader in the Jewish community. I know because I was raised by one and making a difference in the world, but it is so much harder to do that if you feel like you need to constantly be like cutting yourself in pieces to be like a uh, leader here, mom here, synagogue person here, the more we can encourage women to have like holistic, healthy lives where they share their stories and they set good boundaries for themselves, the more Jewish women can achieve. Why do you think that particularly affects the Jewish community? I think that that's a stigma that exists for women everywhere, but it's particularly strong here. What do you think the reasoning for that is? I think there's a couple things. Look, I, I'll be totally honest. I cannot speak to the experience of other women in other communities. I just can't. I'm not in those communities. I'm sure there's plenty to unpack, um, but it wouldn't be like authentic for me to be like, let me talk about what other women in other spaces are experiencing. I, I just, so that's some of the emphasis. A couple things. One, I, I think that there has been this history of like the Jewish mom and like, the Jap and like the horrible nagging Jewish mom 
what if you make for dinner reservations? She's a shopper. And a lot of that like came from our own community um, and the sort of constant tearing down and mocking of women who were running their lives, you know, uh, you know, feeding their kids, raising their kids, raising money for the synagogue, running their religious schools, launching institutions, really building this community into what it is, a vibrant and beautiful, incredible diaspora place in the broader history of the Jewish world. Women are such a big part of that. And then there has been this history of sort of mocking and tearing down Jewish women that I think has entered the sort of broader cultural lexicon. There's the anti-Semitism. There's a sort of run of the mill patriarchy. And then I'm a big believer that the Christian normativity is really detrimental for Jewish women. I know so many Jewish women, high level, Ivy League, double masters women who are like, well, I either have to work part time or not work or not have the Jewish life I want to have because like the calendar issues are so big Um you know, I can't take off work. I can't do this. I can't be the type of Jew I want to be based on the regular work schedule. And beyond that, the um, the gender roles in the community are still really prescribed. You know, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, it was such a horrible, devastating moment. And I wrote that uh, there are so many Jewish men who talk about, like, how great Ruth Ginsburg is. I'm like, well, are you a Marty Ginsburg? Are you? Because... Like Ruth Ginsburg got to exist in part because she had a Marty Ginsburg. Do you are you? Ask yourself. And I like people were pissed. Like I got these emails like, you hate Jewish men, like you don't I was like, I hate Jewish men, I'm married to a Jewish man, like I'm surrounded by Jewish men. I, I love Jewish men. But don't just tell me how like you hope your daughters are Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but like God forbid you turn on a stove once in a while. I think that is someone who loves cooking and has a cooking problem. But you have to be willing to step up. And there's a great quote that the biggest decision you make really is your partner uh, as a professional woman. And that's 100% true. And we need to set that expectation for the men in our community as well. It's just another time when I hope that this podcast is being listened to by both women and men. And I am thankful for the men who reach out to me telling that they listen to this podcast because to say that feminism is an issue that only women have to deal with is like saying that any form of prejudice is an issue that only the people in that community facing the prejudice have to deal with. It's not. Misogyny doesn't exist because of the actions of women. It exists because of the actions of, of men. Because I think that sometimes, more in the past, but still today, there's still a bit of stigma around the idea of feminism because um, people think that it's this idea of women hating men. And kind of like you're saying, when you do talk about um, being a, a good partner to your wife, people automatically assume that you're hating Jewish men, which you're not doing at all. Um, it's what you're talking about here is is sharing responsibility, is sharing work, sharing raising children, sharing holding a household, um, and those are responsibilities that haven't historically been shared. Absolutely. So, like, I'll just use Dyke March as an example, like a moment in my career that was written about a lot and. Um, it was definitely a big moment for me, and I think a lot of other people. Dyke March happened at like 4.30 on a Friday. The only reason I could even be there was to my husband. I remember I was like freaking out. I was like, how am I going to be there? And my husband was like, well, we have a grill, and I have a car, and I will go buy meat, and I will grill some steak, and I will buy a car of cake, and that will be Shabbat. And I was like, oh, my God, that is a possibility. Um, that is a thing that he's like, that is a thing that we can do sometimes, Carly. And I was like, oh yeah, oh yeah. And sometimes I think it's having, you know, when you're fighting that sort of ingrained notion of what it means to be a good Jew, a good Jewish woman, and the responsibilities are fighting with you, there is that sort of ingrained gender role. And having men who say, actually, I could just make dinner or I could pick up shach for the sukkah or whatever the thing is, is really big. Absolutely. And even that internal dialogue that you have with yourself, that it's so ingrained in us that we forget that we are allowed to ask for help. I think that's something that I struggled a lot too. Just being allowed to say, you know what, I need some support here. And that makes you actually very strong still. It's not, this, it's not a detriment to your own strength. And I think that's something that is really, really hard to come to terms with. 
And I think, you know, one of the things that's really key is Jewish organizations deciding that they want to be places that work for women. So, you know, we do have a community, and I think we need to be honest about this, where the pressure to have children is very high. Uh, and look, I remember, you know, at JDCA and at ADL, I've had like incredible bosses who want me to work there, understand that I have other responsibilities and make a flexible office. And that allows for really high achievement. You know, everyone at ADL knows there's a big block on my calendar. At four o'clock, I have to walk out the door, pick up my kid. I bring her home. I put on Peppa Pig and then I go back to work for a little while. Like, but if I had a boss that said, and shout out to Max, he's an incredible boss. If I had a boss that said, no, 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 no. I don't care that there's a pandemic and there's no aftercare. Everyone here has to be at their desk till eight o'clock and that's the culture here. I couldn't have this job and everyone loses because women have a lot to contribute. I think that's another place that advocacy, infrastructure, feminism all intersect, creating the infrastructure in the workforce for women to be able to do it all is a way that American society needs to be flexible because times are changing and the workplace has to change with it. Absolutely. I mean, Carly, I think this is all really beyond helpful and and interesting conversation. And that really brings me to the last question, which is how we like to end all of our podcasts here at Nice Jewish Girls. Um, And it's basically about what the women listening to this in particular, but really anyone, but this conversation, really the women, um, what they should walk away with. Because you talk a lot about ways to balance your life. And I think that a lot of the time, the hardest part is asking for the help, is asking for the time to block out of your schedule or asking for the support making dinner or whatever it is that people need support with is actually being vocal and an advocate for your own needs. Um, What's the advice that you want to give to the young Jewish women listening to this about how to navigate the world as a Jewish woman today and be a strong advocate for yourself? Write your own story. We're all told stories about what it means to be Jewish, about what it means to be a woman, about what it means to be an activist. Write your own. You don't ha- what whatever sort of archetypal story you have in your head, you are so much bigger than. You know, if you had told me years ago that I was, you know, having 151 lobby meetings at the ADL with our grassroots and like pushing the fight against hate, I would have been like, how is that even possible? I'm not, you know, I'm not like prototypical Washington, etc. It doesn't matter. Write your own story and defend it. And like, you have to take care of yourself and your own story and write it for yourself. And some of these ideas about like, you know, what your limits are and what you can and can't achieve, throw them in the garbage. Carly, thank you so much. I feel like this has been such a wonderful conversation. Um, thank you for being so honest with us. And I'm I'm honored to have gotten the chance to speak with you today. It's great to be here. I love what you're doing. I think Jewish women are rock stars and they're incredible. Keep it up. Thank you so much. Sitting and listening to Carly's story, I was so struck by the symmetry. Just like her mother, Carly has changed her career to something she was truly passionate about. Just like her mother, Carly has upheld the promise of Judaism, and she's shared that promise with her own daughters. Just like her mother, Carly is a strong, brave Jewish woman, and she continues that legacy. So it's moments like this when I am reminded of why we started this podcast, to do really what Carly has done so naturally, to continue the story of our mothers before us, to bring alive the stories that have been passed down through the generations, and to preserve them here so that they may continue to be told. And sharing these stories, well, that's a beautiful thing to be a part of. And this, my friends, is where we'll leave you for today's episode of Nice Jewish Girls. Hopefully a bit smarter and a bit more inspired. We really want to hear from you. So please contact us at podcasts at jewishimpact.com. Join us next week when we'll be speaking with Gabrielle Starr, founder of Girl at the Game, a platform that makes sports inclusive and accessible for women. Because I, for one, will tell you that sports are not just for men. Nice Jewish Girls is a production of Unpacked, a division of Open Door Media. Rivki Stern is our producer, and I am your host, Julia Jassy. Check out jewishunpacked.com for everything Unpacked related, and subscribe to our other podcasts. 
also follow Unpacked at all of the social media places. Just look for at Jewish Unpacked. Talk to you later, ladies.